Hi, welcome to Oberlin Stage Left. I'm Alexa Still, I teach flute at Oberlin Conservatory, and I've got the great pleasure of introducing today's event. We're going to watch Composed, a documentary by John Beter and Katie DeRoche. And before we begin the screening, I've got the great pleasure of interviewing Rachel Lander, a wonderful cellist and a featured artist in the documentary. Um, Rachel, um, at this moment, you're stuck inside, like I guess everybody else with your kids and trying to juggle that and teaching online and everything else. Thank you so much for fitting this into your, your hectic schedule. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Nice. So uh, before I um, get into questions, I just want to do a quick intro for the people who aren't jealous and maybe don't know who you are. Um, everybody then. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, it's, it's breathtaking. Um, you're a really successful musician and your quartet, Raven, is, is doing fabulously well. Um, I read that your group does your own material and you tour a lot, doing lots of shows. Oh. Um, you also play West End shows and you play hardcore classical stuff with the London Chamber Orchestra, a London Metropolitan Orchestra. Yeah. You freelance. Um, yeah. You do your own looped cello shows. I was really impressed to see that. Um, it seems like you've done everything from hardcore classical to playing with people like Robbie Williams and Beyonce. It's just, it's just an amazing career. And you have two kids. Yeah. <laughs> I take my head off, really. It's amazing. Um, so the first question I have is, how are you and your family doing at this terrible time? Um, well, it's pretty tough. I mean, it's tough for everybody. And I'm, I'm really aware of, you know, that comparing you know you're suffering to other people's and all that kind of, so I know it could be worse it could be worse like we have a bit of outdoor space here and everyone in my family thus far is healthy and um but obviously being a freelance musician with no contract means that there's like financial insecurity and my kids are five and um just coming up to three and um, I'm recently divorced so I'm kind of on my own with them you know so it is pretty hardcore to be honest with you but um yeah we're sort of getting into a getting into a rhythm of just it's quite nice not to be running around which is what I normally do because I'm juggling you know as you said lots of different work things so yeah we're, we're surviving thankfully wow <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah I think um I think we're all just doing the best we can in the circumstance right yeah but um yeah I'm just so appreciative that you're willing to spend some time with us today. Oh, not at all. So um, I've seen the documentary composed twice now. And yeah, yeah I know. I'm, I want to see it some you're more. A <laughs> I'm a fan. Definitely a fan. I think it should be mandatory watching, actually, for musicians. Um, it still takes my breath away that you are able to reveal such personal things about yourself. And, you know, these are things that people would often regard as closely guarded secrets, I suppose. And you, you share. And I was wondering how you were able to do that. Um, well, obviously, Compose is all about performance anxiety. And, but I, I've got two problems in that I have performance anxiety and I'm also a recovering alcoholic. And, you know, um, part of a massive part of, in fact, the main part of, being in recovery from alcoholism is about going to um, meetings and sharing. And there is this great phrase that somebody, like one of my mentors in recovery told me that when I was very, very early in, and she said, you can't save your ass and your face at the same time. So every time I go to one of those meetings and bust myself, I am freer of something and it tends to help somebody else. And I, that's how I have, got any recovery or sobriety is by listening to other people who have also been you know they've it's not even it's, some people say oh it's you know you're very brave and you're very correct and it's it's not about that at all it's I have to do that in order to stay well and actually I get kind of angry about the, with the classical profession to be honest because when I was at a conservatoire and I was struggling with this it did feel like a taboo subject. And the fact that I chose to self-medicate secretly how I did with vodka and 
you know, in a water bottle. I mean, I was re I was looking back at it. It's just, it's madness. You know, I was doing like Shostakovich seven in a huge <laughs> professional orchestra when I was 21. <laughs> had a bottle of water down, at, down by my feet that had vodka in it in case the panic came up and I would just like pretend I had a coughing fit. And I mean, it was like, you know, really mad. And because I've also, alcoholism is a disease that tells you that you haven't got it. So I had all the denial saying, well, if you weren't doing something so frightening, then you wouldn't have to drink like this. Um, so sorry that I've just massively deviated from the question, but I don't find it difficult to uh, be honest because it's, it's, I'm much more frightened of lying because that is when I was trying to kind of um, put on a front, that's when I drank. So I have to absolutely bust myself all the time. Um, and also I feel like it's important to be honest about it and be a bit brave. And, you know, I definitely have lost work because I've done quite a lot of, I've done three documentaries about alcoholism and performance anxiety, and I've done a lot of press and I've written things in the British uh, broadsheets and tabloids and I've been on the radio and talked about it and I'm very open about it and um, people have said to me like you know you're committing career suicide and I just thought well that's fine because I've never been able to sort of fit into that mold anyway so yeah that's how that was a very long answer to that short question no. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually that was I was going to ask you about repercussions but yeah um... there, have, there have been some definitely but then the best repercussions is when I get emails, particularly from students. And those are my, it's always from students actually, more than any, because once you're in the profession, I think it's more frightening to admit that you've been medicating or that you're struggling because you're afraid of losing right. money and work and all of that kind of stuff. And, there's, and in London, it's very, very competitive. There's not enough work to go around, you know? Yep. So but I often get approached by people who are studying I think in that pressure cooker environment of being in a conservatory, that which does not, it doesn't suit everybody, you know, especially the, the string departments, <laughs> <laughs> you know, lots of kind of technical practice and, you know, all of that. Um, yeah, I get that's, that's when I feel like it was important that I did it because I know that people, I didn't have anyone to talk to when it, when I was going through it, I felt very alone. I didn't feel like anybody said, said anything helpful um people used to say to me things like just really concentrate on the music and i'd be like oh okay <laughs> i mean I can't see the music because i'm going to be sick in front of all these people but cool right. that, that's very helpful thank you yeah well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um one of my next questions was going to be how as, asking you about what's gone on with your career since since the documentary and it seems like you've been really busy um uh <laughs> I have been. I mean, I've mainly been. I did a bit of breeding, so that that took some <laughs> time. Um, yeah, I had two babies in quick succession, and that you know, in terms of performance anxiety, I gave birth uh, pretty much without drugs. And my on my second baby, wow. I had at home, and it reminded me. I don't know. I've, I've felt very empowered by my, by, by being pregnant and giving birth and taking care of a child for me has taken care of a lot of the neurosis I had about my performance because then I, as soon as I started going to work after that, after I'd had a baby, I ceased to worry about whether my vibrato was too fast or if somebody thought, you know, um, if somebody didn't like me at work or didn't like the way I played something, I just thought, God, I wonder if my son has thrown up his milk. I mean, my head was just doing different things and I was just playing sort of, and I, and I found I was quite ruthless and I just, yeah. A bit of sense of perspective maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And also a real kind of, it's an ego deflation. I think you kind of, <laughs> it's, not, it's not as important as all that really. And actually, the other thing that was really good was times where, so when I got sober and I started playing again, I became, it's like, well, now I'm sober and, you know, my career, I was so sort of um, grateful to be back at work and not drinking. Mm. But I had some really big shows and I remember doing, um, I was, I toured with George Michael for a couple of years and in it, there was, an, there was his final tour was called Symphonica and there was a big orchestra behind him and a stadium tour. And there was one night, 
I just couldn't go on. I couldn't go on. I couldn't go on stage. Or maybe I went on and came off. I can't remember. But I remember thinking because the, because the fear was so bad. I had such bad, bad sort of adrenaline that I like, I don't know if anyone um, who's watching this has ever experienced like a full on panic attack where your hands sort of see, they, they close up like this because uh, I'm sure, I'm sure someone will relate. Sure, someone yeah. Yeah. So I couldn't, I couldn't play. And I thought, well, that's the end of my career. I mean, that's it. And then there was another one where I was playing um, opera in the park in Holland Park. I was doing Don Giovanni and I had to walk off and I th honestly was waiting for like, well, that's it. I mean, that's my career over. And actually what happened was the principal cellos of both the sections I was in rang me up, checked that I was okay, booked me for something else the next week. It just wasn't a big, you know, I th all these things that I had in my head as like, if I fail, it's the end of everything. It just wasn't the end of everything. I was wrong about that. And that took a huge amount of pressure off. So there was just, as I kind of went through my recovery and kept going to work and had this kind of, I worked that kind of sober muscle of feeling the feelings and getting through it, I just, it just got a lot easier. But it's funny, you can't sort of, um, you can't give that to someone when they're in their final year at college, you know? It's, you sort of have to, you have to go through it. You have to um, live it. Exactly, and, I, and a lot of people kind of approach me and go, how did you fix it? And yeah. it's like, it's such a big answer and such an unsatisfactory answer because I'm still fixing it. I feel like, you know, I still, I'm sometimes, you know, I play, as you mentioned, in the London Chamber Orchestra and it's a small section and we, and it's um, incredible players in there. And sometimes I get there and I think oh, I am out of my depth because my head will still say all the same things or my kids have been sick all night and I haven't been able to practice the Mendelssohn I'm about to perform or whatever it is. And I don't know, it's just sort of showing up in spite of that, I, uh, you know, but I, I, but I couldn't have done that when I was 23. I, you know, so it's, um, it's a, I hate this, the J word, but it's a journey. <laughs> it really, it really is. <laughs> if, if you could go back magically in time, what would you say to your 21 year old self? I would say you're not on your own. You're not unique. That, that there's a thing in, um, in, in recovery circles where people talk about addiction being the disease of terminal uniqueness, whereas we all think that we are uniquely terrible and life is uniquely <laughs> difficult. Um, and also just kind of, I don't know what, what I do now when I'm on stage and I, and all that fear and adrenaline and the kind of pe what will people think of me and all that chatter that can happen. There are a few things I do. Physicality is a major thing for me. Like I am a mover. <laughs> I don't, I try and move my body as much as I possibly can and not feel locked and bow shaky. I try mm -hmm. and even if that, like might feel inappropriate for the it's like I and I quite often I wear a long dress a long black dress and I take my shoes off and I have bare feet <laughs> because I want to feel rooted to the ground and I try as much as I possibly can and this is what people were trying to naively tell me you know con concentrate on the music I try and be present with the other people that I'm playing with as much as I can and at some point the chemistry in my body changes and I think, okay. And the adrenaline kind of calms down when I first, when I was drinking and then I stopped playing altogether, I just never trusted that that was going to happen. I thought these feelings are going to kill me. I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm going to maybe projectile vomit on the stage I'm, or faint and humiliate myself. And I just had no faith that I could sort of get over mm. the, the wave without medicating it. Um, yeah so and i've that's, had a lot of support yeah if that makes that's, sense that's that's great that's really good okay cool. i <laughs> i mean <laughs> you, you're saying a lot of things which the the documentary kind of heads to but you're putting yeah. in words it's, it's awesome okay. um what what are your thoughts about um how conservatories can best prepare students for a career in performance um that's a tough question because i have thought about this a lot I think that anything that destigmatizes performance anxiety is really important. Right. So, you know, what I, I sometimes have a dream that I will go to a conservatory and hear people who are nervous and get them all in a room and 
talk about it before they play that there's there's a there's a thing and i i have done you know when i do my loop station performances and it is like i can like press the wrong button and do the wrong loop and it's the same thing as i do when i'm in a meeting like if i have to talk in a meeting and i feel nervous i say i feel really nervous and everyone just nods their head and then it's out there and i'm connected to everybody in the room and i'm honest and then whatever comes out is meant to come out and i have to translate that to my playing as well so quite often if i'm doing a loop gig which is quite you know it's in the top of a pub or something it's not in a you know in a really stuffy classical venue <laughs> i say this is nerve-wracking and people just go oh, you know and it's like it kind of um breaks the the ice a bit i think anything that sort of makes it all a bit less formal for when you're in that formative time and also just teachers that talk about it talk about how to deal with if you have a bow shake in this moment you know keep your mm. arms in, like physical things because i i think the focus a lot especially in with string playing is practice your scales in sixths and get it all in tune and get it all correct and all of that and i think it's not addressed that actually we are sort of these living, breathing, changing organisms with chemicals and we have to learn how to manage them. So you need to be doing, practicing performance in context all the time. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think anything like that. And also just sort of being able to talk about it with, uh, with peers and not, there's a, the competitive thing at music college is. Mm. Yeah yeah it's really rough and it's at an age where you're not sure of yourself like you're 18 when you go in those I mean I didn't know anything about anything and I had no faith in anything when I was 18 I just looked at all the people that I felt like were better than me and kind of was a bit cowed and frightened and you know I think some people thrive in that atmosphere but I know but I know a lot of people that didn't make it through music college um so I just, yeah, I think that's just a kind of an acknowledgement that there are going to be problems emotionally. It's a very odd thing to want to do, to just lock yourself in a room and practice the music with dead people all day. <laughs> to be honest, what an odd thing. We're all a bit weird. So. <laughs> well, look, I, I feel like you've already said... Um, have I covered, have I covered it all? Pretty much. But okay. I, I just want to say, is, is there anything else you would like to say to the young musicians who are going to be watching this screening? Um... Not really. I think I've said it. I've, I think I've said it. I just, I think the importance of sort of, because there's a lot of talk as well in that, the, in, actually in that documentary and in life about sort of um, a kind of sports approach. Mm. And that never did anything for me. I sort of had to, mine was much more about um, ego deflation. <laughs> <laughs> and, then it, and that's because for me that's when it becomes like, this sounds so unbearably pretentious I apologize in advance but when that I have had a bit of humility and my ego was definitely deflated when I when I discovered that I couldn't play without vodka and then became a waitress you know that waited on mm. people that I'd played in concerts with and you know it was really gutting that is when I'm a, I'm a much better musician when I'm not in my ego you know and so much so I sort of had to change the way I looked at my playing and how important that was in the context of everything else and you know even now I, I do a lot of because I've had children and I don't tour anymore I do a lot of West End shows you know like I play in Hamilton and mm. uh, Wicked and, no, and those kind of things and you're in a pit uh, so no one can see you and sometimes you do eight of those shows in a week but I have to really come at it from a place of, you know, those people have, in the audience have paid a lot of money for a night oh, yeah. of escapism, and I am a tiny part of that whole thing. I am a cog in a wheel and I can do my best and that's it. Um, rather than make it all about like, oh God, you know, if I miss that shift, will the second clarinet think that I'm incompetent? You know, that all that kind of noise. So I just have had to really change my perspective on the whole business so, yeah, yeah we we do tend to take ourselves pretty seriously oh, yeah. <laughs> so um you're you're obviously a person with um you know tremendous ability to adapt and you've got a really broad outlook i was really um fascinated to read in your bio you you do some work as a 
fitting model for some high street clothing companies. <laughs> and, and, that's, quite, know, that's quite an old biography. I haven't done that for a okay, long time. Right. I've been big kids since then. So, um, <laughs> but you look like you could. You look like you could. Um, yeah. So I was well, wondering. Thing. Sorry, that is another thing. Yeah. I recommend to young people to do something that to earn money in a, in a capacity that is not music related, be a waitress, work in an office, be a pot washer in a restaurant. And, and like that stuff taught me so much <laughs> about, you know, how to, how to collaborate with other people and also how lucky I am. You know, sometimes I go to, I do, I do recording sessions on like big Hollywood movies sometimes. Mm. And I can't believe that I'm sitting there. I can't believe it, you know, and I feel so great, so grateful. I think, God, I'm just a drunk. Like, how on earth did this happen? And then the person next to me will say, God, you know, I really hate this. Just, I hate the temperature in here. I'm pissed off about them. I think, oh my God, go and wash some pots in a restaurant. And then talk to me, we're getting paid 65 pounds an hour. So, you know, just anything that kind of broadens your perspective, yeah. I think is really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my last question was just going to be, um, that wondering if you have have advice for people who are concerned about what happens next after this COVID-19 impact. Oh God. Nothing that isn't like really wishy-washy ethereal because yeah. I am having, I am having to do the recovery thing of not projecting into the future. Like my main source of income right now is from those West End shows and right. the theaters are closed and I and they will be the last thing to open up again and I have no idea when that's going to happen and I and you know a lot of my peers bless them on the it, they're putting videos of themselves playing bark on the internet you know and I'm thinking god I've just like changed five nappies in a row like I've got no <laughs> creative <laughs> <laughs> so um I am I'm trying not to look too far ahead I, and I'm, I'm keeping it in the day. And actually I have had a couple of days when my kids have been quiet. I mean, I say they've been quiet. What I've done is I've plonked them in front of a film and then I, um, I've used the digital babysitter and then I've played the cello and I have really felt like just gratitude that it's all still there, that I can still play, that there is music and you know, this will pass. Whatever this is, it will pass. I just don't know how. So it's sort of trusting that, I don't know, I have, I have a lot of faith that it's going to be okay. I don't know where that comes from. But well, we all love music. Music will come. Exactly. Yeah. Music transcends yeah. everything. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so, so much, Rachel, um, <laughs> for, for sharing all your wisdom and great personality with us. And oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you enjoy the film. <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks. Okay, so I think I think we're good with the recording. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. I I I I I I know they were sort of wanting me to keep it kind of short, so I didn't you know talk yeah. as long as the movie was going to be. But I would I would gladly hear you talk anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just what I'm talking about don't know what I'm talking about at all. <laughs> so. You still feel like sometimes you, you have a little bit of performance anxiety? Oh my God. Yeah, sometimes. Well, I, I just think it's a chemical thing. It's like if you're excited mm. to see someone. Someone did say to me, the neurological, that was another thing that helped me. Someone said to me, fear and excitement is the same chemical process. Yes. You sort of have to change the language about it. So yeah. I'm not frightened, but, I, but I, that didn't feel, sometimes I'm just, I yeah. just, God, I'm really frightened. I'm really frightened. Um, yeah. So I do. Yeah, I do have it. I, I don't think I'll ever be without be without it. But I do know that it passes now, and I know that no amount of medicating it makes it go away. And also, that actually, I think it makes me a better musician because I'm sort of on it. You know, I don't ever sit. Right. Back. If sometimes I go and see symphony orchestras and people are sort of like sat back. And, oh, I know. They look like they're they want they're oh, mentally somewhere else. It's exactly, it's totally exactly. not engaging. Exactly. Like, what are you? You know, so I will never be one of those musicians. So I've sort of, I've had to change my um, opinion about it. Do you, do you experience it? Do you ever have any, do you? Perf I, I, when I'm doing a concert, I'll, I'll I, I'm fine at the start. And then about yeah. three or four minutes in, I think, oh, 
I'm playing okay. a concert, you know. Okay. <laughs> and that's when I have to be really careful about keeping myself involved from present, yeah. like you said, you know, yeah. like like I'm I'm communicating with people. I'm I'm playing yeah. with people and, and exactly. yeah. 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 Or my brain will sometimes go, Are you gonna make this shift just before <laughs> I do it? <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. Like, oh, there it is. Or no, I'm not. You know. <laughs> also, at least in live performance, it's all gone. It's just gone. It's past. Right. Whereas yeah. I do a lot of session work where it's like, oh, might need another one of that. I mean, that's that's very humbling. When when a producer yes. goes, yeah, we're not going to use that. You think, oh, sorry. You know. Yeah. But, yes. Yeah. It is very humbling. Like, yep yeah it is, it is but i feel lucky that i can make a living out of it at all because it's you know it's tough going and there's a, in london there are a million brilliant cellists i mean they're all over the place so yeah the world has gotten really tough it has yeah 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 so well yeah. thank you so so much no problem i'm sorry i probably like talked really fast no 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 you talk but, great and and okay. everything you say is just so fabulous okay thank you <laughs> yeah I, i'm really convinced you're making a real big difference oh to, bless you. thanks that's really nice to, yeah so i mean i hope you feel good about it because it's a huge contribution thank you yeah that's really nice to hear thank you yeah okay okay then nice to meet you nice to meet you thank, thank you very much All right. <laughs> bye bye